everyone. Welcome. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday, September 15th. Um, I'm Julia Black. I'm director of the Creative Writing Program, and I'm very, very excited to be introducing this reading to you tonight. This is the first, this is by me, no means the first event at the Kelly Writers House of the year, but it, this is the first official event of the Creative Writing Program. Um, and we do have a year peppered with many different events featuring our own faculty and students. And we're, of course, always thrilled to be part of many things happening at the Kelly Writers House, or even if we're not officially affiliated with things, we're always thrilled by what's happening here. So if you are new to Kelly Writers House, please keep an eye on the calendar for really um, amazing things coming up. So a couple of announcements about tonight's reading. We do have copies of Piali's wonderful anthology, Good Girls Marry Doctors, South Asian American Daughters on Obedience and Rebellion for sale just outside the Arts Cafe. Please do pick up a copy. And we also have an amazing reception following the reading, so please stick around for that and feel free to spill out into the garden with your refreshments or hang out in the dining room, whichever you would like. Um, so we're going to hear from um, Nikki Donahue before we hear from Piali Bhattacharya tonight, and then the two writers will be in conversation, and we hope that you'll participate also in that conversation with your own questions and comments about the craft of fiction and creative prose. So first, um, I'll introduce Nikki Donahue to the podium. Nikki is a sophomore from Pittsburgh, studying English and political science here at Penn. They enjoy exploring various genres of writing, but favor both poetry and fictional short stories. And if you Google Nikki, as I did, you will also find their profile from May 2021, it, in which they're quoted as saying, I currently have over 30 different stories plotted and planned in my Google Docs. I absolutely love the adventure and fantasy genre stories, and I'm fascinated by authors creating different worlds, cultures, and norms. I would be curious to hear how many stories you have in your Google Docs now, just um, a year and a half later. I'm very, very glad that Nikki has landed here at Penn, and I hope to see much more of their writing in the years to come. Please help me welcome Nikki Donahue to the podium. Hi, people. Um, yeah, I'm just so grateful to be here. Um, honestly, never thought that I would be able to read my work to an audience of people before. Um, wasn't something I thought was possible for me. Um, but yeah, thank you to the Kelly Writers House for being able what happened? Yes, definitely. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thank you to the Kelly Writers House for, you know, hosting events like this. Piali for inviting me to speak with you. But yeah, today I'm going to read um, two short poems and then, you know, if I feel like it, a little excerpt from a personal essay I wrote in Piali's class last semester, um, writing Asian American lives. So yeah, the first one is entitled Dear Frida. For every flower you painted on a broken body you call canvas, you dug your nails into my hips, pressing the moon into my skin, leaving memories that were bound to fade. The crude brushstroke of a fool in love, rudimentary where we saw refined. What would your mother say to a girl like you liking a girl like me? Would you show her the pictures, the prose, the poems? Or would you smile, making certain that no one else could see me the way you do? You keep your genius to yourself, crushing my fingers with your kiss, promising to make me the forever subject of your cutting lines. And then the second one, oh, <laughs> um, thank you. The second one is entitled Boy, Girl, Boy. Alone in his room, boy becomes girl. Her mother's makeup, like paint on her brown skin, red lip, red cheek, a sin bleeding red. Shadows from outside fill up the window, Legs draw like curtains spread. Fingers prod what is there as much as what isn't. She wants to be naked, stripped and sexy. A door opens, and girl becomes boy once again. Thank you. Wow. Um, and then this one is entitled, this personal essay is entitled Self-Portrait as Mother. Pretty little brown girl with pretty little brown eyes. The world still twirls, so why do you cry? She had taken another sip from her blue bottle and its liquid warmth curdled in her stomach. I could only imagine how it felt, the ecstasy that followed, that is. Why are you here, she asked me, 
her tiny voice crackly like static from the TV, and her words slurring together. She was small, skin and bones drowning under a pile of brown and beige blankets. Because I need to take care of you. You're sick, I said, standing in the doorframe of her bedroom. She didn't respond. The dust-ridden box fan that sat on the dresser was on full blast, filling the air with a biting chill reminiscent of winter. Luckily, her blankets sheltered her away from the cold. I remember asking her once before why she demanded we slept with the fan and TV on every night. She had told me it was because the noise and the light kept us sheltered away from the monsters. I didn't quite understand, as old as I was, but I acted like I did and went back to unraveling her box braids, preparing her for a new set. Sixth grade had just begun. A hopeful time for little girls, a growing body, a growing mind, everything sitting just on the cusp of pubescent maturity, but still bound by childlike curiosity. The little girl had long stopped growing, though. She was frail, skinnier than most her age, but her lack of weight was attributed to the persistent illness that wreaked havoc on our lives. I could never let her out of my sight because of it. Looking at her with her closed eyelids and mouth slightly ajar, I sat down on the bed and listened to her faint breathing. Inhale, exhale. It was a steady beat that comforted me as I slid my socks off before joining her under the covers that swallowed her whole. She shifted in the bed, making room for me. Curled up next to her, sorry, curled up next to her, I leached off her warmth like a parasite. It was selfish, I knew that, but I was desperate to let the heat seep into my bones and ingrain itself in my muscle memory. I breathed in the smell of her skin, lavender soap, and I ignored the astringent stench that wafted off of her mouth. It smelt like a hospital, and each breath blanketed the air with her grief. I let my eyes fall shut. We were floating in a pool from one of my many apartments, from one of the many apartment complexes we had lived in. We were always moving. The thing about living with a disease that demanded money, even if it meant the rent couldn't be paid, was the eviction notices came like the Sunday mail. The pool was littered with decomposing leaves and broken branches. The maintenance man never made it round to clean it, and the filth that surrounded us brought me one step closer to understanding the death of Mother Nature. The little girl reached toward me, her hand gliding through the water to find mine. It was brown and bony, and when it wrapped around my wrist, I couldn't help but smile. It was like that, with her hand clutching onto my arm, that we let our bodies drift aimlessly. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Nikki. Thank you guys. So now it's my great, great pleasure to welcome Piali Bhattacharya to the podium at Kelly Writer's house. There is a lot I could say about how much we value Piali's con contributions to our program as a member of the faculty, including her mentorship of our emerging writers, her commitment to engaging race, class, and gender in deep conversations about craft, and her advocacy of students, putting them in touch with opportunities to publish and network and be a part of the writing life. She hosted a whole cohort tour of AWP last year in Philly. Um, but tonight, it's a real pleasure to be celebrating Piali's own writing. To get ready for tonight, I reread Piali's story, What You Won't Say, which appeared in Plowshares in 2016. And I was struck again how in just four pages, Piali's prose densely captures the stifling interior and multilingual soundscape of a queen's restaurant where Bangladeshi and Indian Bengali intonations unfurl a complicated cross-cultural encounter between an exhausted restaurateur and her arrogant customer who can't be bothered to pay his full bill or turn off the sound system in his Mercedes parked outside. The story's narrator leans towards anaphora to invoke the compressed textures of this exchange, thinking to herself, once I had a suite of saris, their gold borders gleaming in the dappled sunlight of my mother's bedroom. Once a man had convinced me that I wouldn't need them because where we were going, the very streets glittered. In phrasings that are alternately clipped and expansive, Piali's prose creates whole worlds, even in the smallest of spaces, both in the world and on the page. Piali's short stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and National Geographic, among other places. She's the editor of the NEA grant-winning anthologies anthology Good Girls Marry Doctors, South Asian American Daughters on Obedience and Rebellion, copies of which, yet again, just a reminder, we have just outside the Arts Cafe. 
Um, she holds a BA from Bryn Mawr College, an MA from University of London, and an MFA from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she's currently the Abrams Artist in Residence here at the University of Pennsylvania, where she's won the Beltran Award for Innovative Teaching and Mentoring in Creative Writing. And this very semester is teaching an already legendary, like a course that quickly became legendary here at Penn, um, called Writing Asian American Lives. And I also want to say, because advanced registration is only a little bit over a month away, that in the spring, you also really don't want to miss the chance to take another one of her brand new courses, because she seems to want to create new courses all the time, which is a lot of work. And I don't know why you take that on, but it's amazing and really great for us. That course is called Points of View, Writing Polyvocal Fiction. I know I just said I'm not going to talk about the teaching, I'm going to talk about the writing, but the writing is polyvocal, and it comes into the teaching. And so here's a chance to plug your classes. Um, it's a new addition to our fiction roster, a course in which you'll learn about a form which I know is near and dear to Piali's heart, which is fiction in which multiple voices sound, how to look at a story from inside the mind of more than one person in it and write our own versions of those stories. Please help me welcome Piali to the podium. Hi, everyone. Um, huge thanks to Julia for that extremely moving introduction um, of, of my work. And I'm really, really grateful to be here tonight. I'm grateful to be here um, with so many students and with you guys. Um, it's super lovely to be um, at Penn and in Philly um, uh, after my, my own college experience here. Um, so I want to read to you um, from uh, from some work of my own, from some fiction of my own. Um, but I also, you know, like this, this event is partially just to say, hi, I'm somewhat new at Penn, and I'm teaching a bunch of courses here, and I hope that you guys will feel comfortable coming and talking to me about that or about anything else you might want to write. Um, as Julia mentioned, um, I teach in the fall uh, two workshops, one called Writing Asian American Lives, um, and another one called Fictional Friendships, in which we examine how we write friendship on the page. Um, and in the spring, I'll be teaching a, a course called Polyvocal Fiction. Um, and um, I think that one of, one of the things that I, that, I, that I hope comes across in a lot of my, uh, my writing work, but also my teaching work, um, is that, of course, I'm interested in um, helping champion diverse voices. But also what, what that often means is that um, I, I don't think that many students, um, especially fine arts students, um, have seen Asian women at the head of their classrooms. And, um, and so I, I want to say that I'm, I'm here for all of those conversations. Um, <clears throat> here for all the conversations about brown drama on campus. That's basically what my entire first anthology is about. Um, very here for the conversations about um, uh, what it means to be a child of immigrants, what it means to be a child of immigrants who wants to do fine arts, what it means to be somebody who hasn't necessarily always been included in the fine arts and wants to do fine arts. Like, you know, all, all of those conversations um, I'm very happy to have with, with all of you guys. Um, and so uh, come talk to me. Come, I mean, take the classes if you want, but also just come talk to me if that's something that you are, are feeling like you want to do. Um, OK, so I want to read to you today uh, from a novel I've been working on for a long time, um, which is partially where my interest in polyvocal fiction comes from, because it's a novel that um, is told in many different points of view. Um, and so I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an introduction to what the novel is, um, and then I'll, I'll read a little bit from it. Um, so as an introduction to the novel, it's called An Inventory of Errors. Um, and as, a, as an intro, um, in the autumn of 2009, so we're like right in recession era New York, um, Dr. Prabir Mukherjee is worried. His successful OBGYN practice in Westchester County in New York, which is just north of New York City, it's also where I grew up, um, has recently taken a heart-wrenching hit. Um, and though Prabir knows he should let the past go, he can't. He obsesses over the case that nearly broke his career until, in a fit of frustration with American medicine, he announces to his wife that he wants to open a restaurant. A lady with a certain standing in society, Nondita Mukherjee, his wife, joins hands with her husband in this venture on two conditions. That they will exclusively use her family's authentic Hindu Bengali recipes, and that she will choose and train the chef herself. Enter Muhammad Shakib, an undocumented Bangladeshi Muslim man. So again, to be clear, the Mukherjees are a documented Indian Hindu Bengali couple, um, and Shakib is an undocumented Bangladeshi identifies as Muslim man. 
They are all, however, they all identify as Bengalis. Um, Saqib has been cooking in Queens for nearly 20 years. Um, he doubts that this housewife has anything new to teach him, and she doubts that he has the skill to learn anything he, he, she wants to teach him. Um, but the pair have to find a way to work together once they open the restaurant. In the meantime, Probir, the doctor, continues to fixate on his interactions with the one patient who made him question his very profession. Her name is Ana Rodriguez, and she's an undocumented Ecuadorian woman um, whose own story is much more complicated than Probir can guess. So those are the kind of two storylines that are in the book. There's sort of Dr. Mukherjee and Ana Rodriguez, his patients, and the, and the story of what happens to the two of them um, in a medical setting. Um, and then there's the kind of more present storyline, which is Mrs. Mukherjee and Shakib cooking together in this restaurant. Um, they're all really mistrustful of each other. And at this point, I want to say that the characters, the, all four characters are chosen very particularly in the book. They're, they are who they are because the, the manuscript is not nearly, it's, it's not interested at all really in the way that America looks at immigrants. That's kind of the perspective that we've been given a lot, like how does America look at immigrants? How does the sort of majority look at immigrants in the United States? That's not really what this manuscript is interested in. This manuscript is much more interested in in the way that immigrants look at each other. Um, so one of the things that, I mean, one of the ways in which we might refer to this is how do immigrants gaze at each other? We talk about this a lot in some of my classes is, you know, what is the gaze? We often refer to it as the male gaze. Sometimes it's kind of like the gaze of the dominant society. But what I'm more interested in looking at in, in this uh, particular story is the idea of who is gazing at who. In what way, when we say that like sort of America is gazing at its immigrants, um, we kind of tend to paint all immigrants as one big brown blob. And that is really reductive to, to many, many different kinds of immigrant communities, even Asian American communities, even within Asian American communities. But, uh, but, even, but even beyond that, I mean, it's, it's pretty reductive to who immigrants as a, as a totality are. Um, and if we want to be seen as immigrant communities who um, are sort of like glittering jewels in our own right in, in each individual community, then we also have to look at the flip side of that and say, OK, well then, if each individual indiv in immigrant community is its own thing, then in what ways are they treating each other and in what ways are they looking at each other both in good and in bad ways? So what are the ways in which they're looking at each other from the gaze of kind of like a classist, casteist, colorist, paperist, by which I mean the, the difference between those who have papers and those who don't, ways? Um, what, are, what are the ways in which the gaze is on each other rather than just from above, right? Um, so as a result, the, the story is interested in binaries. Um, it's two men, two women, two Indian, two non-Indian, two documented, two undocumented. And then within undocumented, there's a Latinx character and there's an Asian character. And part of the reason why I was interested in that is that when we say the word undocumented in the United States, we almost exclusively talk about Latinx communities. Um, and that really erases the fact that there are huge Asian and African undocumented uh, populations in the United States, and that's something that I felt like we needed to just be having more of a conversation about. Um, and I mean, you might guess that this book has taken a long time to write, partially because it has taken an enormous amount of time to research. Writing from each of these perspectives, it doesn't just come out of the blue. It's, it's, it takes an enormous amount of time to, to sit and listen and listen and listen and listen and listen and listen, and, listen, um, and really, uh, and only then even think about speaking or writing. Um, but sort of one, one of the things that I'm particularly interested in for this particular uh, reading is that I'm, I'm interested in exploring documented and undocumented South Asians in the US. What happens when they're in the same room together? They share language, is for, especially for the Mukherjee's and for, and for a character like Shakib, they share language and history and food, but they don't share religion and they don't share nationality. Um, so, you know, from, from the perspective of somebody coming to this restaurant, the people who are working in it will all just look like brown South Asian immigrants to anybody else. But within them, they feel huge divides within each other. And I'm, I'm really interested in what that means. So in this particular excerpt, um, we're going to see 
uh, it's about halfway through the book, and we're going to see Nondita in the first months of opening the restaurant. Um, she's getting used to how everything is working, and for the most part, it's going well. She and Shaki Bar are getting along together. They're working well together. They're getting decent reviews. Um, but she's also figuring out what it means to be in customer service, which is something that she hasn't really been before. This is kind of a class difference between her and Shaki. Um, and particularly what it means to serve the food of your people to customers who are not of that people, and also what it means to serve the food of your people to customers who are of that race. Um, what are the differences between those two things? Food tends to bring out the best and the worst in people, and um, because it's so personal and because it's so attached to the idea of nourishment and caregiving, um, food can bring out a lot in people. Also, I was interested in doing this in the world of food because food writing tends to be a pretty messed up area. Um, there's a lot of prejudice in food writing. There's a lot of sort of Orientalism in food writing very often, um, and certainly food writing in English. Um, and so I was interested in writing a food book partially because I wanted to think about um, how are all of these people who are working with food, how are they thinking about food, and how are they writing about their own food? Um, so this is Nondita about halfway through the book. In a previous life, Nondida would have clicked on any of the bookmarks her son had preloaded for her on her iPad. The New York Times, The Guardian, CNN.com. But these days, she has a new favorite website. Today, when she's curious about the news, what she means is she can't wait to see how many new reviews Village of Spices has collected on Yelp. It has shocked Nondita to learn how many of their customers come to them from Yelp. All those posters they put up, the mailings they sent out, the ad in the penny saver, it turns out that none of them were as useful as a few honest reviews online. Friendly staff, authentic taste, and they'll alter the spice level if you ask. Owners are from my hometown. This place is awesome. It pleases her to read these. She yelps VOS every morning with nervous anticipation and loves trying to match the comment to the customer in her mind. The flip side of this is that she's devastated when the messages are anything short of glowing. Only one person so far has left a two-star evaluation. Good food takes forever. But good food does take forever. We make everything fresh on premises, Nondita typed into the reply box when she saw this and then got a hold of herself and erased it quickly. She has been learning to hold her tongue. If being a small business owner has been exhilarating, then the decidedly wretched part of this venture has been customer service. Specifically, sitting at her stool in the front and forcing herself to smile sweetly at every kind of person who feels the need to give her advice on how restaurants succeed or how Indian food is really cooked. You know, soccer moms address her, the chicken tikka marsala could really use some more marsala sauce. These are the women she had once sat next to on the bleachers while their children had kicked a ball back and forth at each other. Now she pours on them the thickest honey voice she can muster as she responds, thank you so much for that suggestion. Marsala is an Italian dessert wine, but if you'd like more gravy in your dish, I'll make a note of that for our chefs, okay? Those interactions are the rewarding ones, the ones where Nondita can almost feel the tingling satisfaction of a slap against her palm. They aren't all like that. In the beginning, she was so shocked by the audacity of these people that she was genuinely confused by what they were saying. Were they giving her cooking advice? White people were giving her cooking advice for Indian food? It turned out that's exactly what they were doing. But it took her so long to even accept this as a premise that she had let the first several taunts go by with a timid laugh. Later, at night, while pressing thick, healing lotion into her increasingly rough elbows, just before sleep took over, she would come up with sizzling responses, crackerjack comebacks that she wished she could go back in time just to deliver. Instead, she would recite them to Probeed in bed, or to her daughter over the phone, all the time knowing that even if she had the chance, she'd never be so silly a businesswoman as to badger a customer in this way. Still, the repartee, the taste of it on her own tongue, was delicious. It's like I've always told you, Ma, Rudrani would say on the phone once Nondita was done grandstanding. They see a brown woman sitting there, and it can't occur to them that she could be so knowledgeable that she might actually be the one in charge. They have to help her. They have to save her. No, this could not be true. Rudrani is the kind of modern woman who sees racism everywhere. Nondita has chided her about it so many times before. 
Why do you let these people get to you, she says to her daughter regularly. Are you intent on being miserable? They're foolish and they don't mean it. Why do you give them so much patta? But it was true. And it is true. Nundita has had to admit that the alarming consistency with which she is given advice regarding anything to do with her home country, the colors, the spices, is too great to ignore. Yet, better them than her own people. The sad fact has been that though some Indians have been her most loyal patrons, most of them have been her sharpest critics. Each one of them has a recipe they claim is best, and they come to her now, full families of them, instructing her on how she should be altering her dishes, how she's never going to have the support of the whole Indian community unless she serves them a proper rogan josh, or a specifically tailored bangan parta. The ones who know her, which is nearly all of them, expect discounts on prices that are already far too low, and this sends Nondita into a state of near fury, not because she's appalled at their stinginess, which she is. You're an anesthesiologist and you don't want to pay nine bucks for a plate of handmade paneer. But because this is a trait that looks as bad for her as it does for the customer in question. She and Probir have tried all their lives in this country to thwart the stereotype that their compatriots would do anything for a markdown. Don't others want to push back on this idea as well? Still, none of this excuses the ones who finish their meals, don't bother to dispose of their plates, and stride right past Nundita and through the swinging kitchen doors at the back of the house. These are the ones to whom Nundita assigns fresh hexes later. It goes like this. An Indian man, always an Indian man, slurps the very last sip of sambar off his meduvada platter, drops the cup so that it splashes into the coconut chutney, creating a chutney splatter art canvas for, six, for a six inch radius, and wiping his hands on the paper menu meant to stay at the table, rises to belch. Then, and this is the part Nolita dreads, his features start twitching. First the eyes flutter, then the nose scrunches, and Nolita can see the poison of an idea spread across his face. He thinks, wait, is it so? Indeed, it is so. He has had an excellent idea. He comes to the counter, poses boldly in front of Nondita and says, you know, you people need to start making a murihonto. That's real Bangali food, you know? None of this South Indian vada type stuff. Nondita will have to physically restrain her tongue in her mouth. You finished every last bite of your South Indian stuff on your plate. She'll stop herself from saying. He'll go on. You know what? I'll talk to your chef about it, free of charge. He'll attempt to wink and laugh at his own joke, and off he'll trot to the kitchen, no need, as is common knowledge, to ask a woman for directions, and he'll in barge in. Oi, he'll shout, instead of muttering a faint, excuse me. Oi, he'll call again until someone looks up, and then he'll shower them with the gifts of his thoughts on how secretly Americans are dying to eat a mashed fish head stew, a dish Nondita herself cannot stand. So that's Nundita. I want to, thank you. <laughs> um, I want to give you one more small little section of the book, because, partially because um, uh, I wanted to talk to you about polyvocal fiction. Um, and I want to keep talking to you about polyvocal fiction because it's, important, it's, it's something that's important to me. Um, and it's something that I, um, I wonder, I, I'm still wondering, how do we do this? How, how do we write in multiple voices? Um, but this is something, this next section is gonna be a small little sliver of a piece, and it's in the voice of Shakib, who is the restaurant's head chef. He and Nondita have just had a disagreement about something, and this is how he expresses his feelings in the moment. Um, I'll share this excerpt with you partially because I want you um, to notice that hopefully Shakib's voice is very, very different from Nundita's. Shakib is different from her in a lot of ways. He's a different gender, he's a different religion, he's a different nationality, he's a different class background. And yet, the two of them share language, they share political history, they share the same part of the world, and most importantly for their business, they share food, they share food histories, they share family food, they share family meals. I mean, that's, that's what their biggest shared history is probably, other than language. So I wanted you to hear a little bit the difference in their voices and in their tones and inflections. This is Shakib. There's this game we used to play when we were kids. It's called Gabardi. Technically, you need 14 people and a court, but we would play the minute we had four and a clear enough street. Basically, you divide up in even numbers, and one person from the first team has to tag as many people on the second team as possible within a certain amount of time. 
The catch is that the time is equal to however long the tagger can hold his breath while constantly saying out loud the word gabardi. Take a sip of air or let your gabardi drop below a mutter for even a second and you forfeit the point. I remember what it used to be like to fill your lungs that deep. The changras would show off, making big gasping sounds and puff out their cheeks to convince themselves they'd taken in enough to get them 20 seconds, maybe 30. I learned pretty early, all that drama doesn't get you anywhere. You have to close your eyes, calm your mind. Slow your breathing down to the point where your body almost falls asleep. Then, in one go, let your chest rise, watch it expand, sense the air pulsing into all the edges of your core, making your lungs feel heavy but your body feel light. Let yourself get a little dizzy, let everything go, tup job. And then, and this is important, use your eyes and find the kid you're gonna tag. I say kid, singular, because you're only going for one. It's the oportalaks that think they can tag four people that always lose. This is the smarter route. Decide, lock it in, and then run like hell. It's been years and years since I played, but I remember what it's like when you get real close. You've said gabardi, 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 gabardi so many times that you might as well be saying another word altogether. You're running and dodging, but you're also calculating every second, making decisions about every lunge you take, every elbow you throw. Is it costing you too many breath points? Then, Right when you're an inch away from your target, who's faster and more graceful than you thought he'd be, your chest starts searing, like as if you've just swallowed garam mashla. You were fine until then. You were so in the game. You got so far. How could your body betray you like this now? It can't. You won't let it. You keep going, even though you know you still need enough breath to get back to your side of the court, even though you know the tag won't count if you don't make it all the way back. The pain harnessed in your ribcage roars like a dragon, but you start talking louder, start screaming even, gubbardy, 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 and you tag him, and you've got it, and your team is cheering, and you're running, and you're across the line, and breathing feels like sweet torture, and you're coughing like someone poured mati down your throat, and you need water, and you're so glad you're not going to be the tagger again for a while, and you let your knees hit the dust, and Ummi is going to be so mad that you got mud on your shorts again, but you don't even care, because it's over. You did not give up. Would never give up. But something is different now. Something happened on that asphalt between you and the kid you tagged. The minute you touched him, shoved him if you're being honest, you knew the aching would be over so soon and for that you almost had to thank him, but you also saw that look in his eyes as he fell backwards, nearly hit his head. You saw that face of surprise, but also respect, that expression of someone who had once underestimated you. And even though it's possible he might come for you in the next round, it doesn't matter. Because somewhere, on some humid day, you'll share a cold Coke together on some rooftop and talk about the time you really got to know each other. Thank you. much, Piali. It's such a pleasure to hear from the novel. Um, so Piali and Nikki are going to have a conversation, and I'm excited to hear what that conversation is, and we'll talk for a bit, and if you have questions that you'd like to chime in about, do we have a portable mic? Yeah, yes. we have a portable mic in the back. It's not necessarily to amplify you, it's just to make sure that your comments and questions get captured in the recording for the event. Um, yeah, so let's get started. Thank you. Can we just like take a moment to appreciate that reading? Like, I'm not reading. Oh my gosh. I want you to read like all my books now. Like, <laughs> Wei Kei Wong once told you that at the Joan is OK premiere here. And I was like, I get it. Especially <laughs> in that moment, reading your own work. Like, you embodied the character. I get it. Yeah. But anyways, um, would you like to start? I can start, whoever. Uh, you start. You start. Go ahead. Okay, so I think the one thing that I'm most curious about to ask you would be your next class. <laughs> I'm going to take it. I'm going to fight for that position. Um, but how do you even get to the point 
of wanting to write multiple voices. I think that it's very easy as a writer to just say one protagonist, that's the voice, going to stick to it because it's, you know, easier. You can get to more and to some people. What about, like, your experience as a, ri- a writer made you want to write in a, like, polyvocal style? I'm going to say it's that because I think that's what really, it's, it's a really, really great question. And, and, in, and in your phrasing of your question is your answer, which is that you asked me, what about your writing experience made you want to write polyvocal fiction? Girl, the truth is I had no writing experience. <laughs> and that is the only reason I thought I could write polyvocal fiction. If I had had even one iota of writing experience, I would have been scared away from this. Mm. Um, I, I think that, you know, for, for you guys at Penn, um, and this is something I, I'd love to ask you about, um, you know, you are so exposed to so many different kinds of creative writing right from undergrad. Um, I went to an undergrad that I really, really, really loved, but really put an emphasis on English literature and put a much mm-hmm. less of an emphasis on creative writing. And therefore, I had very little exposure to creative writing, even though I knew I was a creative writer, mm-hmm. I don't know, probably from birth, but like I, I knew that. But I had very, very little exposure to it um, until much later. And um, I think that um, if I had had a, you know, a fiction professor or, or any kind of mentor, telling me, here's how to write fiction, here are the rules of fiction, I, I would have looked at that, looked at those rules, and been like, okay, this is not possible. You know? um, I still don't know if it's possible. I still have zero idea if this is anything. But, um, but I, I, I tried it, and I started trying it, because I was just like, this, this is the story that came. The story that came was a story about multiple kinds of immigrants. The story that came was a story that was born from my experience of having grown up in a very particular immigrant community, um, and and just and having a very distorted reality in which all the politicians on TV were car- were always talking about immigrants, 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 but my immigrant community did not feel in community with other immigrant communities at all. In fact, very often immigrant communities in the United States hate each other, um, and so I. I think that for me, that that was the story that was brewing for a long, long time, probably since my childhood, um, and, a, and a story about the multiplicity of immigrants and how immigrants treat each other and how immigrants view each other, both good and bad, um, was the story that came. And I didn't know how to tell that story without telling it from everybody's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are questions for that. There are questions about like you know who gets to tell all of these stories. There, there are questions. There, there are questions about the, the research. I mean, part of the reason why this, this, this process has taken so, so, so long, I'm currently in my 13th year of working on this book. Um, and part of the reason for that um, has been that I, I will not put something out, out in the world without feeling like I have done justice to my characters and their authenticity in some kind of way. I love that. <laughs> I'm just, I feel like it is very easy to be an irresponsible writer mm-hmm. and to know that there is that much care placed in a story that I think the world needs. The world needs it. Um, I need it. I can't, like, <laughs> I I, so. however long, <laughs> I'm, I'm still going to go buy that copy. I'm, like, <laughs> leaping over to get your anthology. I've been wanting it forever. And, like, I've been looking at it in the shelves, asking Joan, who's the bookkeeper here, like, Hi, Joan. when can I buy this? When is this going to be available to me? Yeah. And so, like, I want it. There are people who want it. And I thank you for the responsibility that you are taking on with writing it the way that you have decided to. Thanks. I mean, we'll we'll see how it goes and we'll we'll see what the reactions are. Um I I will always have questions about yeah. about what it means to write in multiple voices and yeah. if other people have questions for me, all I can do is is sit and listen and and hear whatever anybody has to say. I am always here to listen to whatever anybody has to say about the work if it's, you know, coming from the right place. Um but yeah, I mean, we'll we'll see, but but polyvocal fiction um can be I think, if used correctly, can be a really important tool. Mm-hmm. What else was I going to say? Oh, just to let you guys know, like, Piali is great. Definitely take her classes. <laughs> like, when when she was talking, I want you to know, like, 
she's coming to you as a writer when mm. she is interacting with you in her classes the way that she was talking about her book to you guys and to me as well mm. is the exact same way we talk about all of the books that we read all of the readings that we do it's herself she doesn't come from this position of like a teacher gracing you with their knowledge mm-hmm. like it's well, a she conversation she doesn't have any knowledge so you know <laughs> <laughs> i like to differ but um. it's and then it's a conversation very similar to this one here um well i appreciate that nikki because i i don't i don't know how else to approach a conversation with students i don't i mean i I really think of, this is probably true of all subjects, but I think it's really, really true of creative writing. Like, to approach teaching creative writing as if there is a right and a wrong way to do it, or to approach teaching creative writing as if I have an answer that the student doesn't have. Um, I mean, I say this to my students all the time, especially in my fictional friendships course. I, I say this to them, like, I'm teaching this course because I have questions about friendships. I have questions about what it means to be a friend. I have questions about what it means to love a friend. I have questions about what it means to write that love. We are so obsessed with writing, um, you know, romantic love, and we're so obsessed with writing familial love. And I don't know that we are nearly as obsessed as we should be with writing a love that is near that is neither romantic nor familial. And I would love to know what that looks like. I'm teaching this class because I want to hear from you guys, like in your workshop stories, what does that look like to you? Um, you know, I genuinely want to know. I, I learn as much from my students as anything else. Um, and so that's very exciting. And, and, and on that level, I have a question for you, which is that what, what has your sort of workshop experience at Penn been so far? Did you have workshop experience before you came to Penn? And what has your workshop experience at Penn been? Yeah, so um, I have never had a workshop experience prior to Penn. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know what a workshop was. <laughs> um, I was just like, Ava, bestie. <laughs> I dropped Math 103 because, yeah. <laughs> what's a class I can take and my roommate Ava was like well I'm in this writing class you want to try <laughs> email Piali and I'm like knees deep in workshop <laughs> and it's a wonderful experience it's humbling very humbling but workshop is humbling workshop yes. is a humbling place <laughs> but it is so necessary as a writer because one thing that Piali told me um in her in my, the first class I took with her the writing fictional friendships class or workshop um what was I gonna say I had something to say it was really important I swear <laughs> I swear what was I even saying guys can somebody remind me <laughs> yes 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 it was such a great class I totally <laughs> forgot oh my gosh are you in a workshop now no, I'm not, <laughs> but I want to be. But mm-hmm. I feel like I'm going to take all of the fun English classes first mm-hmm. before mm-hmm. I <laughs> get to my, like, ex- exactly. I, I want to save them, you know, save them away. What was I saying? Oh, my gosh, it's going to bother me all night. But anyway, <laughs> we'll come back to it. It but, was. Yeah. It's just essentially it's really important to be able. I know exactly what it was. You as the writer know everything that needs to be on paper. Yeah. The audience, however, does not. And especially in my writing, I find I will write something and I'll be like, it makes perfect sense. Here you go, best friend who knows my life story. <laughs> Read it. And my best friend will be like, this makes perfect sense. But to us, it, it makes perfect sense because we know the details. We know the implications. We know the subtle metaphors. What I think I'm being like quirky or whatever. And am writing something that is like a play on words. It makes sense for us. But like if I want to be a writer seriously and have my world presented, have my writing be presented to the world, I need the experience of a workshop. I need Mm -hmm. to have an audience that is willing to critique me and is literally dedicated to critiquing me. And I think that that is what I found here at Penn. I'm pretty sure you'll find that at any workshop, Mm -hmm. but I think something that is unique, at least in my experience, is that I'm surrounded by such great writers. And so it like ups the ante of like, I need to perform. Not in like a super like pressuring way. I mean, it can be, of course, you know, you know, (laughs) but it, I don't know, it drives you to be your best. And that, especially in Piali's classes, once again, take her classes. No, I'm I'm so glad you said that because I feel like there's such a, um, 
one of the big conversations that happens around creative writing is is can creative writing be taught? Should creative mm-hmm. writing be taught? And um, you know, there's a whole uh, movement of writing on should the MFA exist mm-hmm. um, and should the MFA workshop exist? And one of the things that that has been true for me is that you know. I, I mean, if you can write a book without the MFA or without any kind of workshop, even undergrad workshop, you're a genius. That's amazing. Good for you. Please do it. You know, like I, I was not such a genius. I, I needed the guidance and mm. I needed and like that's not to say that workshop is a magical place. It's not, you know, workshop is a really tough place and workshop will bring you to your knees sometimes, you know, um, and workshop will humiliate you and workshop will lift you up. Um, it will do all of those things. Um, but I needed workshop. I definitely needed workshop to understand where my writing was falling within a certain register. I needed workshop to understand um, who my audience was. That was a big one for me in, in workshop. Who, who is my audience and who am I writing for? Um, again, a question that I still struggle with sometimes. But um, but I needed workshop in order to uh, to sort of find out who I was as a writer. And, and in some ways, it was only in workshop that I... I, I couldn't I couldn't find out who I was as a writer until I was in very deep conversation with other people who call themselves writers. Um, and that's, I think, really the thing that I've been so like excited by with with the pen undergrad creative writing program, particularly, is that you guys call yourselves writers from the minute you get to this campus. Like Julia makes sure of that, you know, and like that's something that um, that is super exciting because I didn't get to be around other people who call themselves writers, especially fiction writers, until much later in my life. And it, the minute I did, it was, I mean, it, like the floodgates opened, you know, like it was like a different set of conversations I was having. It was a different set um, of, of ideas I was having for the page even. Um, but it took that in order for me to get that door all the way open. Yeah. And I, I agree. A similar experience. To me, writing was literally just like every headcanon I had in my mind. <laughs> like, oh my God, I totally could see this like tropey romance story. Time to go write about it in my Google Docs. <laughs> and it wasn't until I got to workshop that I was like even considering non-romantic stories. Mm-hmm. Um, you had mentioned that like we are so obsessed with relationships in terms of like romance and that was true for me. Like even in her class that was dedicated to writing about friendships, the workshop piece I submitted first was romance. <laughs> like it was romance. What is friendship? What is romance? Who knows? <laughs> but I think that, you know, yeah. I don't even know what I was going to say. Can I ask you, where did your poems come from? Because I haven't heard you read poetry before. Yeah. So you had a very wonderful conversation with me in the halls of Fisher Bennett (laughs) about um, self-portrait as mother, Mm -hmm. reading as poetry. Mm -hmm. And you recommended that I take a poetry course. And I was going to, and then I didn't. But anyways, I actually started (laughs) taking poetry seriously as like a genre that I could create um I picked up some random books that were on the tables in Fisher Bennett that were just like poetry books we went to AWP and I bought some poetry books from various tables and stalls and was just like flipping through them and reading them and I was like I do this like I can do this and I do it without even knowing that I'm doing it but like it doesn't make sense because I don't have any actual intent behind it. And that's where they came from. Uh, yeah. Like a want to, I don't know, do more, challenge myself, but also see in myself what you saw in my writing. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And, the, and, you know, like that's the thing about reading. You know, one of the things that I tell ri- young writers all the time, but also just writers and also myself, is that please read more. <laughs> like that is, I'm really trying to work on this. I feel like I read a lot. I have to read for work a lot. And it's still never enough. It's still you, you're the only way to get more more ideas as a writer is to read. And like yeah. it's that I mean I really resonated with what you said just now in terms of like it's only when you read something and you're like, wait, I kind of do that that you're like, oh, but maybe so then that maybe it means I could do that. Mm-hmm. Maybe it means I could do the thing that this person did and publish it. You know, um, but yeah, I think that's. Um, 
that that's been such such a huge source of not just my writing but also my teaching is just like what are we reading what can we read more of where can we read more where can we where can we make sure that the students are getting more readings and and more interesting kinds of readings and more diverse kinds of readings like where where are we getting our readings from is a big part of it for me um do we want to open up and see if there are questions um from the audience um So you said an interesting thing. You said immigrants don't like each other. Mm -hmm. um, can you give me an experience that, that you've had or something that you've read about? Because I've never heard that said um, before. And I, quite, I found that quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I think that immigrant communities are, are not in their home countries for a reason, right? Um, and very often they are in this country um, for a lot of like sort of geopolitical historical reasons. Um, so it's not surprising to me that um, Indian Americans don't often find community with Pakistani Americans or that Japanese Americans don't often find community with Korean Americans. Um, that's not shocking to me because um, there are a lot of really um, intense historical reasons for why that might be. And very often, uh, when immigrants leave their home countries, they take a lot of those uh, political and uh, violent histories with them. Um, and so it's very, it's hard enough to be friends with your neighbor at home. It's even harder to be friends with your neighbor when you're far away and you're not in the right context. Um, so it, it, when, I, when I say immigrant communities don't like each other, I'm not judging them. It makes perfect sense to me. I know exactly why. Um, it's just, what a shame. And, and what can we do to, to make that better? Hi. Hi um, I first got to know you as a writer last semester. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in your class um, where I'm getting to know you as a teacher as well. And so I'm curious if you could talk more about how teaching informs your writing and vice versa. Because oh. um, you spoke a lot about workshop from the participants' perspective. Mm. But as someone who's also like mediating it, how does that impact your work? Oh, what a wonderful question. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, you know, I, I am by far a better writer since I became a, a, a writing teacher. There is no question about that. And I think most writing teachers will tell you the same thing. Um, part of that uh, is the tremendous honor that it is to write a syllabus. Um, syllabus writing is a very particular act. Um, it, is, it, it, is a, it is a document in and of itself. A syllabus is a serious document. Um, and to produce it requires a tremendous amount of heart work, not just head work, but heart work. Um, if you care about what your students are going to read, and like, what, what, do, what do any of us want? Those of us who are writers, if, if we are given an opportunity to tell somebody, hey, here's a few things I think you would love to read, it's like the greatest honor of our lives, right? Like, is like to, to tell other people, here's what I love reading, here's what you should read. Um, because all writers, we're readers first and foremost, right? We are writers because we are readers. We are writers because reading spoke to us. And um, so to write a syllabus full of readings that I want to share with other people, it's, I mean, it, it truly is a privilege to me, the act of syllabus writing. Um, to go beyond that, when that syllabus then becomes a live document and is in the hands of other human beings, um, that, that brings another layer because then all of a sudden, I have another responsibility, which is that not just, hey, read this, but hey, read this and get out of it so many of the things that I got out of it. Then there's another layer, which is, hey, read this, get out of it so many of the things that I got out of it, and also tell me the things you're getting out of it that maybe I never even got out of it, right? All of those layers are sort of building on each other when you're teaching. Um, and this is why I, I really, really believe, especially Creative Writing Workshop, like there's no way to do it other than in conversation. There's no way to do it other than sitting in a circle. There's no way to do it from a lecture podium. I just, I cannot understand how to teach creative writing from a podium. I don't think it really works. Um, there, it has to be um, a two-way street in which I'm asking the student, hey, read this, isn't it cool? Um, and the student is like, I mean, kind of, but it's also weird, yes? And like, you know, and, and I'm like, 
yeah, but that's what's cool. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like um, all all of that is kind of like working together um, in in teaching. And I think that like what what makes what makes teaching so beneficial to writing is this idea that like all the things I'm reading. I'm reading 15 more times because of my students. Each and every single one of them has a different perspective on that reading, and I get to read all of those perspectives, and therefore my head is full of at least 15 more ideas than it was this morning. And that makes me a much more in-depth writer. Um, by ver the, the other part of teaching that is, that is astonishing for the act of writing is that when you have to explain how to do something, you learn how to do it way better. <laughs> that is the other part of it. It's like when I'm, when I'm talking to students about why it's important to write in scene and why it's important not to stay overly long in exposition, all of a sudden, like the whole time in the back of my mind is like, are you doing this? Are you are you doing this right? What is what's what is that last scene you wrote? Is that is it enough scene? Like you know, like that the whole time I'm thinking that right. And when I come back to the page on my non-teaching days, I'm like, did I did I do what I told them to do? Did, and that's it's a big part of it. Um, so yeah, thank you for that question. Hello. So I have a question for both of you. Yeah. Um, so as both a reader and a writer, how do you choose what you read? Because I get severe dec decision paralysis when I choose things to read. Like, do I read, I don't know, um, like Min Jin Lee's yeah. book, or do I read that old white guy's book? Yeah. I remember reading um, Catcher in the Rye for fun because I never read it in high school, and I was severely disappointed. <laughs> so I just want to know what Piali and Nikki, how you both choose what to read. Great question. Nikki, how do you choose what to read? So as a student, a lot of the things that I'm reading during the semester come from assigned readings. Mm -hmm. um, outside of that, I know you're not supposed to judge books by covers, but I judge books by covers. <laughs> and then and like, I'm like, oh, that's a really nice cover. Wow. The girl on it kind of looks like, you know, my people. And <laughs> it, like, it's not going to be another white protagonist mm -hmm. so let's pick that up and then I'll read the blurb and you know it really just comes from dedicating time to spend like dedicating time to spend it in places where books are so That's like a great answer. not even just mm. bookstores mm. you don't have to go to Barnes and Noble go to I think it's Spruce mm -hmm. that bookstore that has like books piled up to the walls um, is, it, is that one Room of One's Own? Is that the... Yeah, I forget yeah. the name of it. House, House of Arms. Yes, yeah, House of Arms. Yes. yes. Go... I'm sorry. And last word, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but even, like, over the summer, I volunteered at um, an info shop. Like, I think it's the country's oldest info shop in Pittsburgh. Um, and it's called The Big Idea. Completely, like, wasn't paid spent mm. hours there opened mm. and closed but it was full of books and mm. I was just reading off the shelves because I was in a place where that was being fostered so yeah that's what I do outside of school in school it's everything I'm assigned that's an amazing answer by the way spend time in the places where books are and, mm. and they will find you yeah there's a question at the back hello this is Zelda, Zelda. Um, well first what is an info shop <laughs> See, I had the same question. It's like I, don't, I can't even tell you. I just heard it. Like I heard my, I heard like my coworkers say it all the time, and I would always be curious. Uh, they have zines that are published locally from like local places, um, and its main point is to talk about politics. So maybe it's that. I don't know. I can't tell you. I'm so sorry. That was a disappointing answer. I know. Yeah. Maybe it's just that. Maybe it, Maybe it, it provides all the that. information. Maybe it's just that. Well, I am a little disappointed. But anyways. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I have a question for my dear coworker Nikki. Yes. Um, I think I had an inkling that you were a writer, or maybe you told me, but I have ADHD. So no worries. Don't no worries, remember. Me too. Um, but I figured as such that you wrote a little bit. Um, and wow, you have 30 stories plotted. I, um, I wrote three pages of a novel this summer and that was that was it that's enough uh, <laughs> um, that's a, that's a and anyways so i was i was wondering um you know because you have this uh connection with piali um 
And um, I'm th- I didn't know about that, the polyvocal class. That sounds very interesting. And Me maybe too. you'll see my face there. I maybe. hope so. Yes. But yes. anyways, um, that's a long-winded way of asking, like, in any of your stories, do you try to do any polyvocal techniques? Do you um, incorporate multiple voices or anything like that? I'm, I'm curious to know. Also, an aside, I read Min Jin Lee's book, Whoever Said That. So good. It was really good. Yeah. Pachinko? That was really good. Anyways, <laughs> continue, Nikki. Um, yes, actually... The one that I am working on primarily with my roommate, hey Ava, um, is going to be a polyvocal book. I didn't even know that was a word I could use to describe it. I would just say, like, it has multiple perspectives, you know, like, multiple people are being the voice of this book. Polyvocal, love it, going to be using it from now on. Um, Sound like a writer or whatever. Anyways, but yes, this book is about gay teenage drama and murder. (laughs) Sounds like a Sounds proper amazing. polyvocal story. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I will say that the word polyvocal is inspired by Julia. I was going to call it multivocal, and Julia was like, I think polyvocal is a better so, fit. So and I was like, see, this is why you're Julia. Like, th- that, that's exactly <laughs> this correct. Is why you're Julia. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, um, this is why. Maybe one last question? Anything? Yeah. Mike? Hi. Hi. Is this on? Oh, okay. Yeah. Hi, it's so good to see you both. Um, I was curious about your um, research for Mm. your work. Um, I'm interested myself in writing um, that has to do with like immigrants and history and all that stuff. Lots of research to do. Um, But I was wondering like, I I kind of assumed, I guess, that you did interview mm-hmm. um, and I'm sure like reading as well, but um, when you're interviewing, I was wondering like, like if you go in with a plan, what, what kind of, what your process kind of is totally. and um, if you, like knew what you wanted from the interview or had like a plot or characters even in mind um and if that influenced how you chose like the subjects for your interviews um just all of that that's such a good question and thank you so much for asking that question because it's it's a question that i think writers so so often have and don't often have an answer to and and kind of have to figure it out on their own <laughs> as i bumblingly did but um but actually um one of the one of the answers to one of the very like concrete answers i can give you to this question is that when i first started realizing that i was going to have to do not just a little but like heaps and mountains and decades of research to be able to write this book um I started doing interviews in the communities I was interested in. I started reading a lot of history and and current fiction in the in the uh, communities I was interested in. But I very quickly realized that I was in way over my head. Like there was no way to do this um, in in a in a sort of methodological fashion. And I needed some guidance there. And I literally went and got um, a master's degree in anthropology. Um, and it was one of the best things I've ever done because um, I, so I have master's degrees in both anthropology and in fiction and both of them really have a lot to do with my work. Um, and I think that um, if you are able to take um, some intro anthro courses while you're here, if you're interested in, in research in your work um, and particularly in your fiction work, um, Anthropology will teach you how to do something called ethnography. Ethnography is when you do research in specific cultural communities and you learn how to speak to people in a way that, first of all, is not dehumanizing and uh, speaking from the point of view of, of a sort of colonizer. Um, but but certain but s- uh, secondarily, it'll teach you ethnography teaches you how to listen and how and how to sit um, and how to ask questions without intruding um, and how to listen and sit and listen and sit and listen and sit. Um, and, um, and I think that I'm, I'm very grateful um, 
to have had anthropologists in my life who taught me a lot about ethnography. Um, because without ethnography, uh, certainly reading is necessary, certainly history is necessary, certainly textbooks are necessary, certainly all of that is necessary. But of course, um, the, the sort of primary source material for me was just years and years of interviews in New York City with undocumented uh, South Asian chef populations, so Nepali, Bangladeshi, Indian, Sri Lankan, all kinds of different chef populations, um, lots and lots of interviews um, in New York with uh, uh, patients who had been who had, had gynecological issues, um, all kinds of different things there, um, lots and lots of interviews with uh, the New York Ecuadorian community, um, and then uh, the, the flip side of all of these pieces of research were that um, I applied for grants in order to be able to travel to Bangladesh, Nepal, India, and Ecuador um, and, uh, and, and interview the families of all of the people I had interviewed in New York. Um, again, this took over 10 years to do. Like to, to do all of this took a long, long time. Um, but I think that it was only in having all of those conversations with all of those people and really sitting with everything they had told me um, that I could even think about creating a voice that was fashioned out of all of those voices. Um, but it took uh, really learning how to do ethnography in a responsible, ethical way um, in addition to research in the way that I had been taught in my undergrad to do research, in addition to learning how to write fiction in a voice that didn't sound coming from on high. It took all of those things. It took my MA in anthropology, and then many years later, I went back to graduate school, which I didn't think I was gonna do, but I realized I still needed to. I still had a lot to learn. I had to go back to graduate school to get another MA in fiction. Um, and you don't have to do it with grad degrees. I did because I really, really needed that guidance, and so I just, applied and applied and applied and applied until I found programs who would pay for me. But um, that, for, for me, that was the only way to, to be guided in this way, both in ethnography and in fiction writing. Because the thing is that I did the eth ethnography part, um, and then I was like, okay, but you've only told me how to write research. How do you write fiction from this, you know? like, how do you, And I realized my early drafts were all coming out as research writing. They were all coming out as like, you know, sort of field notes. Um, they were not coming out as fiction. And finally, I was getting so frustrated that I was like, I don't know how to write fiction. Like, I'm, I'm writing nonfiction, like, from, from all these research notes. How do I write fiction with this? Um, and so I had to go back to graduate school again. Um, all for this one book. <laughs> and, um, and so we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see if any of this has mattered. We'll see. But, um, but that's the only way I know how to do it. Does that make sense? Thank you guys so, so, so much. Thank you, Julia. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Please, please stick around. Reception, books, mingle, chat. What a pleasure to hear from you both. Yeah. Thanks again for coming, everybody. Yeah. Thank you, guys.